Chapter 23. Patterns of Behavior. Well, my child, it's quite dangerous to explore places where you do not belong. Where were you headed that you ended up in my private chambers? Curiosity. I halted. Bobby pin and screwdriver hovering between me and the wall safe. A steel hooves muttered comment. The safe was the only container within the Helping Hoof Clinic, which hadn't been successfully scavenged by ponies before us. Anything that could hold valuables had already been looted. Brighter spots on faded walls showed where medical boxes, probably locked, had simply been torn away from their mountings. Huh? Elegant as ever, little pip. Stuhoves whined. Your little friend Homage asked me what I thought your defining characteristic was. What? When? Oh, goddesses. What does Stuhoves tell her? Please don't let it be bad. Or embarrassing. While you were hospitalized, Stuhoves responded bluntly. Do you really find it surprising that she would ask your companions about you? No, not really. She was probably trying to get to know the real me more especially before taking our relationship to the new level. It was... wise. I just wasn't sure Steel Hooves was the pony I would have wanted her getting a reference from. What did you say? I asked nervously, and then felt immediately stupid. He just answered, didn't he? I mean... okay. Curiosity. That isn't so bad. Yeah, I'm curious. I don't think you could call it my defining characteristic, though. We're walking into hell, Veldremery interjected, and little Pip is sightseeing. No, I argued. I'm not. I stopped talking at knowing her smile. Hey, the clinic was right here, right on our way. And you know we could use the medical supplies, if we had any. Yep. Y'all should have seen little Pip in Stable 24, Clamity agreed, mimicking my voice. Poorly, I might add. He called out, Dangerous critters, let's explore! Hey, you're the one who wanted to go on the next adventure with me. I figure she's been like this ever since stepping hoof out of her own stable, Clamity concluded. I reckon I can't blame her, living in a box. Oh no! Velvet Remedy chimed in. She was like this inside the stable, too. I sighed. Apparently, this was going to be T's little pip day. I turned away, choosing to focus on the wall safe and let them have their fun. Velvet Remedy continued. While other colts and fillies decided to try new things in an effort to provoke their cutie marks to showing, they'd try soccer or ballet. Little pip? She tries to invent the art of breaking into other ponies' private things. I broke the bobby bin, which was really frustrating since this lock was well beneath my skills. I took a deep breath, looking in a random direction that was neither the safe nor my friends. Pyrolite had perched on an IV stand in the corner of a medical bed. Behind her was a Ministry of Peace poster of a smiling Fluttershy with a white rabbit sitting on her head, and colorful birds and butterflies flocking around her. The top of the poster read simply, Remember, but the bottom half was so badly damaged that I couldn't tell what it was trying to say. There must have been some gentle but insidious power in Fluttershy's image, for I found myself feeling ashamed that we had forgotten what she told us not to. Well, I grunted, hovering out another bobby pin. Maybe curiosity is my virtue, then. My three companions looked at each other quietly, skeptically. Pyrolight let out a soft whoop as smiles broke out across her faces, or at least, across the muzzles of Calamity and Velvet Remedy. Simultaneously, they turned to me and told me that no, it was definitely a vice. Well, that was unexpected. Calamity noted, staring through the open safe into the building adjacent to the Helping Hoof Clinic. The entire back of the safe was gone, as was a significant amount of the other building's wall. Judging by the damage, it looked as if some 
magical energy weapon on the scale of the Junction R7 cannon had been used to melt through the wall. Some pony had a hard on for this safe. Well, they were stupid then, I commented. The blast probably destroyed anything that was in here. Still who spoke. I don't think this is the safe they were intending to use that weapon for. How do you figure? First, the safe was hidden. It's likely they didn't even know it was here. Steelus was right. The safe had been hidden behind a large, framed sign. Most scavengers wouldn't have thought to pull it down and look behind it. But ever since Homage revealed her safe behind the Splendid Valley painting, I'd fallen into the habit of peeking behind frames. Something which undoubtedly added fodder to my companion's discussion of my so-called vice. I glanced over to where the sign was propped up against a medical rack. It was very much unlike the posters I had grown used to. A more forthright and clinical warning from the past. Wartime Stress Disorder For over a thousand years, ponies have known only peace. It should be no surprise, then, that so many have not been able to cope with the harsh realities of war. Wartime Stress Disorder is a very real illness that affects thousands of pony each year. Know what to look for. Depression, anxiety, lack of sleep, loss of appetite, unpatriotic thoughts, suicidal impulses. If you or any of your loved ones are experiencing two or more of these symptoms, it may be WSD. If so, ask for help. No pony needs to suffer alone. Knowledgeable and caring ponies, trained by the Ministry of Peace, are waiting to help. I spared her only a glance before turning my attention back to Steel Hooves. Having read the sign before floating it down, I didn't need to read it again. Second, Steel Hooves continued, having apparently paid more attention to our surroundings than I had. The building next to the clinic was a bank. I had admittedly dismissed the building next door after discovering the doors were blocked by interior rubble. I could see now through the safe that a fair amount of the interior was intact, and the bank promised to be interesting. Okay, I said, floating out the zebra rifle. I'm going through. I started to climb up into the safe, only to feel teeth bite down on my tail and pull me back. Oh no, you ain't! Calamity said, letting go. Ain't no way the rest of us can wiggle through that thing, he said, pointing a hoof at the wall safe. I opened my mouth to protest, but he cut me off. I ain't letting you brave that place alone. Whatever destroyed that wall might still be lurking in there, Calamity smirked. Besides, you said your next adventure would be with me. You promised, and I'm holding you to it. I slumped. He had a point. Then, I brightened. Once I'm inside, I'll be able to see the rubble blocking the front door and levitate it out of the way, so I can get you all through the front. It'll only take a moment. They looked at each other again, and I could read on their faces as a begrudging acceptance that this was going to happen. I set my hooves to it, and there was no stopping me, short of a tranquilizer dart to the breast. I floated out the zebra rifle ahead of me my current weapon of choice. Clemmy and I had spent time in the early morning looting the locked ammo boxes from the surviving convoy chariots on the overpass. As a result, I was no longer worried about the ammo for the zebra rifle. I had been surprised to find that, even up here, everything that wasn't locked up had been looted. But Clemmy reminded me that he wasn't the only flyer in the equestrian wastelands. I counted us lucky when we had moved beyond Hellhound territory and into the jagged hellscape of the Philadelphia suburbs without any encounters. During our trek, Calamity and I scouted ahead, being by far the stealthiest members of our group. I had kept my pit buck radio off. Only the tiniest amount of noise leaked out of my ear bloom for others to possibly hear. But I suspected the keen-eared Hellhounds might notice even that. I was yearning to turn it on again to hear what else Red Eye might have to say. With a second look at the safe, I decided to shruck uh, my saddlebags. It was going to be tight, and I didn't want to get stuck. 
I could float them through behind me once I was inside. Or, worst case, go back into the clinic and get them after I cleared the bank's first floor. No encounters also meant I still owed Calamity an adventure. And I wanted to pay off that debt before we got into the heart of Philadelphia. We were looking at trotting into slaver territory, and I feared for my companion's safety. It's not that I doubted their ability or courage, but the anxiety I felt didn't lend itself easily to words. I suppose I feared that my friends were not only dear to me, but would be dear to them in an entirely different and unpleasing way. In the eyes of the slavers, what kind of prize would a Pegasus be? Or Velvet Remedy? The goddesses only knows how they would react to a steel ranger. And the last thing I could afford to do was launch an assault on the entire damn slaver army. Honestly, I was almost to Philadelphia, and I had no idea what I was going to do when I got there. My entire plan was to get there, take a look, and pray what I saw would tell me what to do next. With dismay, I accepted the very real possibility that I may get there only to turn around and slink back home. My friends were counting on me to be better than that. All those slaves were counting on me, or some pony, to stand up for them. I suddenly pictured myself trotting up to a gate, knocking and telling a guard on the other side, Hello, I'm here to stand up for the slaves. The daydream ended with the image of me getting shot in the head. So yeah, maybe I was sightseeing. Distractions to give myself time. I pulled myself onto the narrow black rectangle of the safe and slithered through. A mare approached me just the other day. Thank you, Red Eye, she said. You have given my life meaning. I was wretched before, but now I am part of something great. And I know that something even greater waits for me. The opportunity of a lifetime. Of course, she was only saying this in an attempt to get close to me, so that she could use the crude knife she had crafted out of stolen metal. But still, her words moved me. So, I did not have her killed on the spot. Instead, I sent her to the pit, where she would have the chance to exercise those murderous impulses for a more worthy goal. Velvet Remedy had darted into the mayor's room, off of the bank lobby, and we were all politely pretending not to hear her. The lobby radio helped, and Red Eye's words added to the buzzing of the flies. Looking around, it painted me, it painted me that my stomach wasn't rebelling nearly as hard. The stench made my eyes water. But I had seen too much, too often. I could tell I was becoming numb, and it scared the horse apples out of me. I heard water start to run in one of the restroom sinks, and felt a sudden urge to dash in. We hadn't checked the local water, but I was sure it was still radioactive. Velva must know that, and I doubt she would think clearly. Displayed ponies, pony body and profane graffiti, Velvet said, with a weak smile as she rejoined us. Raider Sheik, she turned to me. Let me thank you again for taking me to such lovely places. I honestly felt bad about this one. Once, the lobby had been a place for ponies to mill around while waiting for their turn with one of the tellers whose counters lined one side of the room, or who had business in the back meeting rooms like the one I had crawled through from the safe, whose backside had been obliterated. But the raiders had taken a perverse glee in defiling this place, the extent of which I hadn't seen since the Ponyville library. The crucified dog hanging from the ceiling lamp was a particularly revolting touch. I agree with little Pip, Clamity noted, having taken a look in the rear meeting room which had abutted the clinic. Raiders living here tussled with some invaders who were a heap more dangerous. Lots of raider bodies, none of their attackers. Well, one, I corrected him. Sorta. The pile of ash at what had been the center of the magical destruction 
had still been glowing slightly pink, suggesting the battle wasn't that long ago. Calamity nodded. My guess? Lucky shot, he said. From the way the whole wall was disintegrated back far enough to touch the safe next door, my guess is that one of the invaders was carrying a saddlebag full of energy grenades or something, and one of the raiders put a bullet through it. Well, they obviously didn't get in through the front door, or the safe. So that means there's another way in here. I looked at Steel Hooves. Do you remember what the building on the other side of the bank was? The noise from somewhere above us killed the conversation. Dust rained down from the ceiling as Pony Hooves clopped over the floor above. The hanging lamp swayed as they passed over it, a rotting piece of the crucified dog falling to the floor with a meaty sound. I floated my rifle close. Calamity gave his battle saddle a reloading click. Honestly, Velvet Remedy whispered, has it ever occurred to either of you that they might be friendly? Nope. Stand back, Steelhoos growled, gleaning his intention. I dashed for the bathroom, wrapping a surprised Velvet Remedy in a loving Levitation field, and pulling her after, in after me. Pyrolite dove in through the doorway over our heads. Calamity swooped back towards the meeting room. Boom! The shot from Steelhoof's grenade machine gun detonated against the ceiling in a flash of fire and scusto. With a rendering crash, the ceiling came down, bringing five raider ponies crashing into the lobby. One buck, with a mangy coat and a flaming skull for a cutie mark, landed hard on a teller counter and bounced out of sight. A mare, with a spiked pink mane, got herself tangled in a gruesome exhibit fashioned out of at least three colts' entrails. A zebra soared falling from her muzzle and clattered across the floor. It slid to a stop at Calamity's hooves. One last raider pony stood above us at the edge of the collapsed floor, a hunting rifle floating at his flank. He, his gaze fell on me, sliding down my body. And now, I did vomit. His eyes widened, and he dart, darted <clears throat> out of sight. The other raider ponies tried to scramble to their feet. Steel Hooves rapid fired six more grenades into their mists. I saw Velvet Remedy's shield flicker around the two of us. Just in time to save us from the blast of shrapnel and bloody body parts. The eyeball of a raider pony splattered against the magical shield inches from my face and began to slide down. I ended up vomiting the contents of my stomach after all. Canned corn does not taste as well coming up as it does going down. Now when the fell over here got away, Calamity called out hovering in the air on the other side of the teller's aisle. A doorway into the bank's back offices marked the raider's most likely avenue of escape. Spitting out another mouthful of water from my canteen, I replied. Had another one upstairs who bolted too. I felt weak and embarrassed, but tried to focus on the danger at our hooves. The surviving raider ponies could be getting reinforcements, assuming there were any to get. I was more worried that they were setting traps. Calamity snorted. Raiders run from us now? He flew up to the room above. Of course, I could be fixing an ambush. Velvet Remedy looked at Calamity's underside. Oh, come on now. Are you really that surprised? She poked a hoof at me. The smallest of us is a walking arsenal. You're a pegasus with a custom-built battle saddle. And steel hooves is Steel Hooves. By Luna, we look like Grim Reaper ponies. Velvet Remedy trotted towards the carnage. Any raider this well-armed, she said, floating a blood-stained baseball bat with gruesome nails driven in through the rubble, is going to take one look at us and gallop for the hills if she has any brain left at all. I grimaced. Not that I minded looking like a Reaper pony to raiders, I damned well ought to, but because Velma's comments brought back memories of the twisted view of us that Steelhooves had once professed to Calamity. 
Steelhooves was looking at the zebra sword. The gem sword in its hilt was cracked and blackened. Whatever enchantment the weapon had once had, had died with that stone. Okay, I said, collecting my thoughts. The main vault is in the basement. The other way into the bank is probably upstairs, coming across from the next building. I looked at my companions, giving them an opportunity to discuss, or disagree. Velvet, Steel Hooves, you two head up. Between the two of you, I'm sure you can greet any pony you find up there with the appropriate levels of loving kindness or overwhelming force. Velvet Remedy shot me a weary look, but nodded. How in Luna's name did I end up the de facto leader again? After seeing how my fellow stable dweller handled a hellhound, I wasn't so worried about her safety. I'm the safe cracker, so I have to head down. Calamity, you are with me. POW! A well-placed twin shot from Calamity's battle saddle caused the magical energy turret to explode. So a flinging shrapnel across the hall. Slipping into sats, I targeted the two remaining turrets and unloaded two rounds into each of them. They barely got a shot off, scorching the armor plate on my utility barding and giving me a painful but bearable burn beneath. We crept up past the guard desk and peered down the hallway beyond. It had a few doors that opened to side rooms, and at the end was a massive metal door of the vault, a terminal glowing on the wall beside it. As Calamity started down the hall, I paused at the desk. I spotted a book which had slid down behind it. Increasing your sales figures. The picture on the front was a satisfied customer eating an apple. I floated the book into my saddlebags, having exhausted my current collection, and left it at Junction R7. I trotted into the hallway, catching up with Calamity. A scorching bolt of green energy shot past me, hitting the wall behind us and melting a hole, turning the fox wood panel into and bricks beneath into glowing green goo. There's nothing better than the smell of melting zebras in the morning. Crap. One of these. Back! I shouted to Calamity. The two of us barely made it into the corner when the multi-limbed hoverbot floated around the corner. I felt flame lick at my tail as the robot hosed down the hallway we had just been in with his flamethrower. Ow! Ow, ow, ow! I pranced, flames licking at my tail, until Calamity stopped out the, stomped out the fire. Ow! Pardon. I whimpered, tears in my eyes. Thanks. On our way down, Calamity had prodded me to unlock every ammo box, coin till, and desk. His saddlebags were now virtually overflowing with golden pre-war coins, as well as packages of cigarettes and bubblegum, and other things he considered worth the wait. I wasn't really expecting to find a merchant we could trade with in Philadelphia, but I said nothing. I had taken most of the ammo, including a prince's prize of four magical energy grenades. Well, grenades did the trick last time, I whispered, floating two of them out. And, unlike alicorns, I'm pretty sure I can trick these things the same way twice. I sat on my haunches before the wall-mounted terminal next to the vault door, the smoldering wreckage of the hoverbot in the hall behind us. The door to the vault was almost identical to the one in Shattered Hoof, except that this one had no exterior lock, rendering my skills at lockpicking useless. However, by hacking into the terminal, I was sure that I could tweak the spell matrix and get the door to slide open. Calamity stood guard over me as I worked. We both looked up when the muffled sound of an explosion echoed from somewhere several floors above. Not loving kindness, then. Nope. If I survive all this, one day I'm going to sit down and write a sequel to the Wasteland Survival Guide, covering all the things Ditsy Doo managed to leave out. I love the ghoul pony, but seriously, the whole section on rat hogs and barely mentioned the hellhounds, and the chapter about making robots work for you was completely hoof-fucked. 
I concentrated on the prize before me, working my way through the possibilities of code until I settled on the right one. This was almost as hard as Pinkie Pie's terminal. Almost. With a series of loud clanks, the vault door slid open and down into the floor. I raised an eyebrow at that, and then stepped into the vault. Some pony had already been in here. Only a scattering of pre-war coins remained, and most of the smaller safes that lined the walls were open and empty. Well, now I'm depressed. I took note of three smaller safes, and one large one, which still seemed intact. The locks on those suggested the level of skill required that was beyond, well, was beyond the work of the same rival lockpicker who had made a mess of the hippocampus energy plant, number 12. No, that would be absurd, but the little pony in my head wouldn't give up the notion. I started on the largest safe first, confident in my ability to beat it, and eager to show up my imaginary rival. It took effort to open the safe, but the tumblers finally fell into place, and the large door nudged open. I pulled it back with my telekinesis, enthusiastically, driven to see what's inside. Inside were two objects, one of which I had seen before, recently, through binoculars, an anti-machine rifle. Only this one was pristine, with gold, flame-styled gel, a custom bit, deep uh, citrines embedded in the barrel, and an embrossed em nameplate that read Spitfire's Thunder. It was also broken down to fit in the safe. Summer assembly acquired. Calamity whistled at the sight of the massive gun. My own attention was drawn to the small box next to it. A box had a familiar apple insignia on it, although just one, rather than three, on Little Macintosh. I floated it out. The box had a lock of its own, but it looked significantly easier to pick. Them gems on that there barrel. I've seen them gemstones like that before, Clamity was saying behind me, still fascinated by the gun. I held an enchantment that sucks up the buck of the gun, makes it so that a pegasus can fire it, without getting knocked off course. I chuckled. He probably thought that he was being subtle. You want it? It's yours, I grinned. I've even got some bullets for it. The box with the apple clicked open, and I realized I've seen a box like this before as well, in Vinyl Scratch's safe. Like that one, this held four memory orbs. I set the open box down. Behind me, Calamity was doing his best not to squee. Thank you, little Pip. That's mighty gracious of you. Calamity, I shushed him with a smile. Stand guard. I might be gone for a bit. The orange man Pegasus spotted the box of memory orbs and nodded, turning to face the vault entrance in a battle ready stance. I tilted my horn down towards the box, picking up a memory orb at random, and focused. The bank. Calamity, and the entire equestrian wasteland washed away. Applejack was looking at me like I had lost my mind. And just what the hey did you think you're wearing that fur? I'd really hoped to learn more about the past. And, with any luck, the mayors of the ministries. But to find one of them addressing me, up close and personal, this seemed beyond the stroke of fortune. The room around us looked as lovely as the suites in Ten Pony Tower must have been in their prime. This was a ministry hub, perhaps? There was a song playing in the background that I heard before. I want to calm the storm, but the war is in your eyes. How can I shield you from the horrors and the lies? When all that once held meaning is shattered, ruined, bleeding, and the whispers in the darkness tell me we won't survive. It took me a moment to place it, but I had once seen Steel Hooves virtually entranced by the song. To remember tonight, I felt my mouth, mouth say, 
The words came out in a smooth, low rumble. Oh, Luna! It was Steelhu's voice! More urban and not nearly as gravelly as the ghouls we knew, but it was definitely him. How the hell had this memory ended up here? In this bank? It only now occurred to me that maybe Steelhoofs had known what the building next door had been, not only because he had noticed it today, but because he remembered it. Ah, oh, hell no. I ain't got nothing to do with y'all while you're wearing that ridiculous recollector, Apple Snack. Applejack put her hoof down. Now, take it off. Wait, what? Oh no, I really, really shouldn't be here. This was private, and... I'll tie you up with your own lasso. Applejack's eyes went wide, a blush forming on her freckled cheeks. Oh, sweet Celestia, have mercy. Not only was I invading Steelhoof's private memories, but the buck was aroused. I could feel a hot hardness that I had fought to escape from. <clears throat> I prayed to the goddesses to pull me out of this memory, spare me from this, and my ghoul companion too. He didn't deserve to have me here, and I very much didn't want to be here. Eyes narrowing dangerously. And just what makes you think you have what it takes to best me with my own lasso, soldier buck? Part of my brain paused to marvel at the country filly turned major political figure had fallen for a city buck turned soldier. Steel hooves, no, apple snack, leaned forward. That hot pressure in his groin becoming unbearable to me, and whispered huskily, because I know it turns you on. Way too much information! Please, Celestia, Luna, any pony, stop the memory! Need to get off! Now! Ah! I mean, leave! Need, need to leave now! I almost felt my prayers were answered when a loud chiming sound rang out from a nearby glowing terminal. Applejack shook off her dear cotton sleigh headlights expression. Still no, she decided, turning away towards the terminal. Now I got to take this. And you best not be wearing that thing when I'm done. You look ridiculous. I felt my host sigh, then trot slowly towards what I recognized as the bathroom door. A sudden shot of horror went through me. Apple Snack was still sporting his hardness. Celestia, please, don't let them have a full length mirror in there. A cry of dismay from the orange coated mare solved my concerns with startling quickness. What's wrong? I felt myself say in Apple Snack's voice. The mayor of the Ministry of Technology was scrolling through information on the terminal screen as fast as her hoofs would let her. No, she moaned. No, they wouldn't. Her voice was becoming louder and more strained. No, they, they, how could they? Again, more firmly. AJ, love, what's wrong? Edia turned towards her shoulder, towards her soldier buck, with a start of tears in her eyes, and a frightening edge in her voice. Iron shots! That's what's wrong! She, she spit as the other emotions struggling behind her face lost out to fury. One year! The Steel Rangers have been around for one year, and Iron Shod Firearms has gone and built a gun designed to punch through their armor. They've built a gun to kill our own. I felt Apple Snack go rigid at the news. The blonde main mare was strutting back and forth in barely contained outrage. They're calling it the anti-machine rifle. But what it really is, the anti-magical power armor rifle. She spun, tears in her eyes. How long before the zebras get a hold of this? They've just killed our own. I felt my host swallow. He was doing amazingly well at keeping his heart rate down. But I could sense Apple Snack's emotions. I could feel the physical toll. I put everything I had into finding a better way to keep our soldier ponies safe, Applejack raged. I sold my farm 
I, I fought the ponies of my own ministry to get this done. She turned, her white eyes filled with tears. I sold my farm. A lump formed in my throat. My heart hurt for the mare, and my hooves wanted to lash out at the evil ponies who could be so thoughtless. The orange pony spun and bucked her bureau so hard that it shattered into splinters and piles of clothing. This is a betrayal. They can't do this. My host watched as his mare looked around for something else to buck. Then, she seemed to have a better idea. I'm going down there, Applejack decided abruptly. I got family down in Ironshot. Brayburn will listen. I felt a sinking sensation in my heart. Steel hooves, Applejack barked, addressing my host. By not her lover's name, but his military designation. Call Wingrat. Tell him to be on the roof in two minutes, and to have my personal chariot ready. If I leave now, I can make it to Iron Shop before morning. Maybe I can head this whole thing off before... AJ, love, Owlsnack offered slowly, trying to be reasonable. If they've already invented it, then you can't put that apple back on the tree. I knew it was right. The other item in the safe had been proof enough of that. Applejack shot us both a look. Or at least, it sure felt that way. Well, some pony ain't getting any for a good bit. If I could speak, I would have told her that such expectations had long passed. Now, make that call! The orange pony turned back to gaze at the shattered fragments of wood and dresses. Great. Now I've got to find something official looking to wear. Less than three minutes later, Steelhoofs was saying goodbye to Applejack as she stepped into the elevator outside her suite. The call to Wingrite had been made, and the Ministry Mayor's chariot was waiting on the Pegasus landing platform. I'll be back before you know it, Applejack insisted, dressed in a stiff, formal suit dress that did not appear to get much use, and looking slightly less murderous, but no less determined. I'm sorry, this night ain't gonna go like you were hoping for. I'll make it up to you. Promise. She turned and raised a hoof, touching the button for the landing platform. As the ornate doors slid closed, she cocked her head. And take that recollector off. You look, the doors closed. A soft whir could be heard as the elevator began to ascend. My host looked up, watching the arrow above the elevator doors slowly glide across the numbers. Floor four, five, six. Applesnack turned back towards the door, and his and Applejack's suite. The recollector was actually starting to itch. A loud thwang sounded from inside the elevator shaft behind him. He spun back towards the ornate doors as he heard Applejack's elevator carriage rumble downward past his floor, gaining speed. There was a loud, horrendous, middle-twisting thud. I burst back into the real world, shaking from the memory, still feeling Applesnack's scream as if it had come from my own lips. Looking up, I found Steelhoof's visor staring down at me. I cringed back, wanted to crawl into the safe. His low, gravelly voice simply stated, definitely a vice. What is unity? The voice of Red Eye sounded in my ear bloom. Calamity and Velvet Remedy had naturally taken the lead as we worked our way back through the bank. My hooves felt heavy, like mine were the ones wrapped in steel. I couldn't look at steel hooves. I could feel him staring at me, not saying anything. It was so much worse than being yelled at. Unity is you. Unity is your family, your mother and father, your brothers and sisters, or at least it will be. I have seen it, and yes, 
Unity will be me as well. But, for now, I am merely its, and thus your, humble servant. The goddess has gifted me with the vision of unity, and it is she who will bring peace to this troubled land. Think of me as nothing but a courier, delivering a message of evolution. We follow the goddess in her great quest to heal this land and all the good ponies within it. No pony dies in Philadelphia unless they choose to. And in the new Equestria, no pony will ever need to die again. When the time has come for your toil to be over, you have but to submit yourself. Already the goddess is taking those who come to her, pulling them to her bosom, and transforming them. Their old, weak, sick bodies are peeled away, replaced by a new, transcendent form. As we were passing the open doorframe of an office, Steel Hooves lifted a metal-clad hoof and shoved it me inside. He followed clearly. Clearly, he wanted to be alone with me. Looking anywhere but him, I stammered an apology. He ignored it. Which one did you see? He asked coldly. I looked up at him, startled. Which memory did you see? I flushed with icy embarrassment. The one where... I fought to find the least intrusive description. Applejack learned uh, iron shod making anti-machine rifles? Oh, Sulu said. The other three memories were locked safely away in his pack. The accident. I recalled Applebloom's strained voice. Some folk were saying that maybe it wasn't much of an accident. They say that maybe it was some pony within her own ministry. The biggest row Applejack ever had was over the anti-machine rifle, Stilhoves informed me. I sensed that, having seen the memory, he wanted me to have a touch of context. It was abnormally forthcoming from him. Even more, how considering how deeply in the wrong I was. On the one hoof, I couldn't really blame them, Stilhoves has admitted. You wouldn't either. We saw some of the robots, the zebras, had begun to deploy on the battlefield. I found myself nodding. Despite my ache in my heart for Apple, Applejack, I remember the tank-like sentinel robot in Four Stars. It fired. I fired at it with armor-piercing bullets from a sniper rifle at a distance of yards, only to have a precise shot to the volatile area I had managed to shop, stop it. But I knew how bad that hurt her, and how deeply personal she took it. Only, maybe it was worse, as she had family in Ironshot. The whole thing just tore her apart, he nickered behind his helmet. The damn thing was, the zebras came out with armor-piercing ammo a few months later anyways. Not as effective as anti-machine rifle, uh, taken down with fellow rangers. But, a well-placed round from a rifle could punch through a ranger's helmet. Steelhoof looked me over until his visor's gaze stopped a little Macintosh in its holder. Truth is, with armor-piercing ammunition, that gun could do it. Little Macintosh is probably the most powerful firearm of its size. A touch of nostalgia crept into his voice. Designed with the kind of buck to the teeth, that only a mare like Applejack could handle easily. Despite how I was feeling, a snot of laughter escaped me. According to Spike's theory, Applejack was strong enough in the tooth to haul not only her own weight, but that of all five of her friends, with nothing more than a bite on a dragon's tail. I had just begun to notice that all the content I was getting about the firearms and not about the accident itself, when a thunderous gunshot rang out. Was that Spitfire's thunder? How far ahead had Calamity and Velvet Remedy gotten? 
And what have they run into? I darted around Steelhoof's bulk, dashing out of the room and towards the sound. I could hear the heavy hooves of the Steel Ranger falling behind me. That was a warning shot, I heard Calamity state, his voice muffled and slightly mumbling. I don't give two. Warning shots are supposed to miss, Velvet Remedy barked sternly. I didn't hit anything vital, was his response. He was speaking slow. His words sounded like they came through clenched teeth. That weapon, a gruff mare's voice insisted, is the property of the Ministry of Wartime Technology. Surrender it, tribal, and we'll let you live. Horse apples! Now I could tell why Calamity's voice sounded so warped. He was talking while holding Spitfire's thunder in his muzzle. He was better at it than the slaver with the shovel spear whom I had encountered at my first night out. But not by much. The only reason y'all ain't grown us tribals to bits is that you don't want to hurt the pretty gun. I heard Pyrelight let out an alarm squawk. Damn! Steel was muttered from behind me as he broke into a full gallop. Leaving me swiftly behind, I lowered my head, charging forward, trying to keep up. Little Macintosh floated beside me, ready for action. I came barreling into a lobby full of ponies and stumbled over the severed hind leg of a raider. Losing my balance and face planting into the rubble of a collapsed ceiling, Little Macintosh clattered into the rubble. Ah, she tripped me, I offered weakly, getting up. My eyes widened as I took in the five Steel Rangers in the room, only one of which was Steel Hooves. One of the four new arrivals had taken a shot through the leg, and Velvet Remedy was fussing over it to the ponies charden. Clamity seemed intent on staring down the other three. Without the massive Spitfire's thunder, my companions and I would have been helplessly outmatched, and assuming Steel Hooves remained on our side. Steel Hooves was standing rigid, staring from Calamity, the unique anti-machine rifle held in his teeth, to the Steel Ranger he had shot through the leg. If it was Applejack's fears were playing right out in front of him, Calamity's habit of shooting first couldn't have reared at a worse time. The lead mare of the Steel Rangers, Quartet, was splitting her focus between Calamity and Steel Hooves, addressing the latter. What are you doing with these primitives? Steel Hooves ignored her, staring at Calamity. You shot a Steel Ranger. Them friends of yours came at us with intent to murder. Velvet Remedy spoke again. Calamity's right. The moment they saw us, that one's missile launcher opened up, she said, pointing a hoof at one of the other Steel Rangers. And this one's charging at us with a magical energy lance. I ask you again, said the lead mayor, stepping forward. What are you doing here? Soldier, report. The two uninjured Steel Rangers behind her charged their battle stances to better cover the room one of them targeting me. I cast my eyes to the floor, searching for my little, where little Macintosh had fallen. Steelhooves growled at Calamity. We will have words. Then, bothered to spare the mayor his attention, he answered, You are not clear for that information. You need only to know that I am on assignment and that you are interfering. Now order your knights to back down. The tension in the air was nearly suffocating. I am Senior Paladin in the Ministry of Wartime Technology. You will address me with proper respect befitting my rank. As will you, Steelhoofs replied with, with gravely calm, when addressing a superior officer. The younger Buck's voice sounded behind the helmet of the missile launcher ranger. Elder Steelhoofs? The question was met by a still room. I spotted little Macintosh, but didn't care to float it up from the floor. 
certain that some pony would start shooting. Calamity broke the silence. Elder? Well, guess who's been holding out on us? My apologies, Star Paladin Steel Hooves, the senior paladin said carefully. I did not recognize you. Your armor is that of a much lower station. Steel Hooves nickered. Apology accepted. He turned to the younger buck. And I would thank you for not calling me above my station. If you know of me, then you know I refuse that position. The lead mare was not done, however. You are far from your stomping grounds, Star Paladin Steel Hooves. By protocol, I should lead you to meet with the Elder Blueberry Saber. The light on her helmet swiveled to illuminate each of us in turn. As for the deposition of your friends, she began. There with me, Steel Hooves said firmly. Lead. I shall follow. The steel encased mare turned and trotted out the back. Velvet Remedy stayed close to the wounded one as he rose to his hooves, favoring his injured leg. As the rest of us began to follow, I floated a little Macintosh to me. The gears in my mind were beginning to turn again, and while I knew better than to start asking questions in the middle of a tense diplomatic situation, it was clear that Steel Hooves and I needed to have a big talk. Star Paladin Steel Hooves, sir. The young knight called out, trotting closer to Steel Hooves, while the other injured knight covered Calamity and me with the light machine gun of her battle saddle. Again, my apologies for before. The matter is past, Steel Hooves said flatly. I sensed this was not a conversation our ghoul companion wanted to have. I found myself mentally cheering the young knight on. Permission to talk, sir? No. Oh. The knight stopped in his tracks, letting us pass him, then trotted to catch back up. In that case, permission to speak freely, sir? Still his head dropped a little. No. The knight slowed, but did not stop this time. Permission granted, Knight Boom, proclaimed the senior paladin. To Steel Hooves, she whined. My troops, my territory, my rules. Sir, I just wanted to say, there are a lot of Steel Rangers who felt the same way you do, about following the path of the Ministry's mayor. I mean, if you hadn't, if you had taken your rightful place as Elder, a lot of us would have gladly followed you. Stilhoos remained impassive. The silence stretched out as we trotted through the suburban wreckage that surrounded Philadelphia. Slowly, the young knight dropped back into position behind us. I heard his last words, muttered to himself, before he fell quiet for the rest of the trip. We still would. When I was a young buck, I was taught that somehow, some ponies were inferior to others. That those not born as earth ponies were weak, frail, unsuited to labor, incapable of pulling their own weight without relying on magic. You, my children, prove every day that the only ponies who are inferior to those who chose to be. Unity is more than just the blessing of the goddess. It is our search to transcend the laziness and weakness of our ancestors, to reach a higher level of existence. Unity with our fellow ponies, not tearing each other apart, but building each other back up. And Equestria with us. And you, my children, are already halfway there. In you, I see unity already lies within us, should we just choose to embrace it. The glorious evolution that awaits us is just the icing on the cupcake. Explosions ripped through the street. Still who stood alongside the other rangers as they tore into the slavers, taking cover behind the ruined chariots and carriages, and even behind the wagons full of slaves that were transporting into the heart of Philadelphia. Red Eye's voice died when the grenade barrage from our ghoul's battle saddle obliterated the slaver's radio. 
Through the din, no pony heard the shot from above that tore through the knight's nightbuck helmet. Ripping it off his torso, his head turned in a jelly inside. A Pinkie Pie balloon floated overhead, turning a raging fuchsia by the dripping sun. Take cover! The senior paladin yelled, and the rangers scattered. At the turn of events, the surviving slavers began to press forward, filling the streets with suppressive fire. I hid behind a trash barrel as bullets riddled it. If the bin hadn't been full of another age's reuse, the bullets would have likely torn through it and perforated my body. As it was, a few which punched through were stopped by my saddlebags and barding. I got this one, Clemity called out, soaring into the air, Spitfire's thunder strapped across his back, intent on going one-on-one -on -one with the Pinkie Pie balloon. From behind a mailbox, Velvet Remedy focused on invoking her shield spell, bringing it to, the, to brief life between our Pegasus and the slaver ponies who turned their guns to fire at him. The moment their guns were trained away from me, I dove around the trash barrel, slipping into sats and putting shots into the heads of three of them, courtesy of the zebra rifle. Their heads erupted into flame as they fell, and two more were doused in flickering green balefire that sent my pit buck clicking. They stumbled, screaming, as pyrelight flew over the slavers. I could hear shots exchanged above. The slaver pony, who had been hiding behind the slave wagon, a lavender and green unicorn mare, wrapped the remaining remains of the night in a levitation field and floated it towards herself. Sats died, only to activate again, partially refreshed. I looked down the scope of the zebra rifle, but I couldn't get a clear shot with the wagon of slaves in the way. They were cringing, trapped in the open. I saw one tan-coated mare mouth, don't shoot me. Wait, what was I thinking? I focused, wrapped the entire wagon in, my, in a field of my own, and gently hauled the slaves, slavers cover out of my way. One of the other slavers opened fire at me, forcing me to dive back behind cover. I felt the levitation field slip, but caught it before I dropped the wagon full of helpless ponies. A hoot and a flash of green fire announced the death of the slaver pinning me. I turned and looked back into the street, just in time to see the lavender and green unicorn floating Night Boom's rocket launcher and firing a rocket through the display window of the store where the wounded Steel Ranger had taken cover. The storefront blew out in smoke and rubble. A moment later, the Ranger Mare with a light machine gun tore at least a dozen hole in the Unicorn Slaver. The unique sound of Calamity's battle saddle rang in the air, coupled with an explosion. Hoorah! The Pegasus swooped down to hover near me. You see that? Shot the grenades right out of her mouth. While doing a triple somersault dodge, he pumped a hoof in the air. Who's the best shot in the equestrian wasteland? I waved a hoof at him, urging him to take cover. A crackling whoosh sounded in the air. My shadow leaped across the ground as the sky above us suddenly lit up. Pointing to his breast, Clamity indulged in a bit of gloating. Winner of the best young sharpshooter competition, four years running, that's who. Oh dear, Velvet said, sitting up in the air from behind her mailbox. Her face was painted with flickering light. I felt a splash of dread. Calamity, still hovering in the air above me, turned his face upward, his voice trailing off. He was watching, astonished, as the Pinkie Pie balloon was consumed in flame. His mouth hung open. Flammable gas? He finally mouthed. The fucking slavers fill their dirigibles with flaming bull gas. Apparently. Little Pip, Calamity, Velvet whimpered, waving to our attention. It's falling our way. I knew I should move, but the holocaust above transfixed me. Bits of burning material started to rain down around us. My trance was broken when a blazing swath of thick cloth landed on the trash barrel next to me, dripping it in flame. 
Celestia clopped my clit with a, cloof, a hoof full of sunshine. Run! I dove around the bullet-filled trash can, running down the street as fast as my short legs could take me. The light above was getting brighter, and I could feel waves of heat pushing down at us. I didn't know. How could I have known? Clemente shot past me. What fucking psycho pony would do that? The imprisoned ponies turned towards the inferno in the sky and screamed. The air burned in my throat. Mercifully, I still had my levitation field around the wagon. I floated off the ground, towing it with me as I galloped down the shattered street, trying to put distance between us and all of the massive ball of fire, shaped like a Pinkie Pie head herself. It was slowly crashing to the earth. I gave a prayer of thanks to Celestia and Luna. All of my companions had survived. Two of the Steel Rangers, however, had not. Why? The Paladin Mare asked as I unlocked the wagon and set the captive ponies free. I looked to her in surprise. I started to ask what she meant, only to recall Homage's words of warning about the Steel Rangers. Honestly, most of them would be more interested in saving your pit buck than saving you. I realized the Steel Rangers probably engaged the slavers for a motivation completely different than my own. The revelation tasted sour. Because it's the right thing to do, and because, if I was in their place, I said, remembering that one time I had been, I would wanted some pony to do the same for me. Velvet Remedy's ears perked. She listened in to our conversation as she moved to give aid and comfort to the ponies who had been trapped in the wagon cage for what looked for looked and smelled like weeks. They were malnourished, scarred, and had slept in their own filth. One of the ponies was dead, had been long enough to begin to smell, but the slavers hadn't bothered removing the corpse. I felt a simmer of rage. Turning from the sight, I stared at the impressive mask of the Steel Ranger. Why did you? The more Red Ice forces advance, the more ground we lose, the senior paladin explained. He covets the technology of the past that is rightfully ours to protect. We cannot engage his army directly, so we attack his supply lines. Part of me wanted to scream at the metal-clad pony about her priorities. Instead, I scowled at the news. I had not expected the outskirts of Philadelphia to be a war zone. Philadelphia was home to major hubs for both the war, Ministry of Wartime Technology and the Ministry of Morale. But we lost our hub to Red Eye's forces three years ago and had been forced to fortify in a secondary position. My scowl increased. Any imminent plans to take it back? I felt the steer the Steel Ranger Mare glare at me behind her mask. Presumably, she was taking me to the fortification, so there was no cause not to tell me about it. But that freedom of information did not extend to anything tactical. Steelhoofs, however, stepped up and answered, No. I heard the Mare nicker, bristling inside of her armor. But Steelhoofs didn't care. Why should we? By now, the building's been stripped of anything worth reclaiming. Stepping closer to me, still has demanded. Come with me. I wish to talk with you alone. Perfect, because I wanted to talk to him. Why are you with us? We were in the burned out husk of a small diner. Still has remained, as always, hidden and expressionless behind his armor. And not that hogwash about having nothing better to do at the time, I demanded. Once we were alone, Leader Lex Steelhooves had vanished, and once again, I was inex inexplicably in charge. Only this time, I really wanted to be. You said you were on an assignment. What assignment? Steelhooves' tail swayed. Remember when you eavesdropped on my conversation with Calamity? The picture I painted of you and your friends? I nodded tightly. He surprised me with his next words. I don't believe any of it, he told me. You're not a spy. 
or a secret agent from some Ministry of Awesome Black Ops stable. You're a good pony, who is a victim of her own good nature and innocent curiosity. Sitting on his haunches, Sue has continued. In my assessment, you have survived out of luck, growing skill, and the unusual fortitude of having capable friends who are willing to stick by you even when you're amazingly stupid. Well, gee, thanks. I follow you because you are a better pony than I am, and you remind me of some pony else. You honestly strive to help and protect other ponies. I believe... He paused. There was a hitch in his voice. I believe... She would have approved of you. Shilu's dug a hoof at the red and black ties, tiles, charred and scattered, that covered the floor. I told you before, not every Steel Ranger had the same view of our oath. I've always believed that we should follow in the example of our ministry's mayor, Applejack, that we should be pledged to her goals and priorities, that we should protect other ponies, both with our technology and our fortitude. We weren't meant to steal and hoard. We were meant to defend. I nodded slowly. I have been faithful to my oath in a long time. But at your side, I can be again. I looked away, the ghoul's words sinking in. When I looked back, I fixed him with a stare. That was the most heartwarming cart of horse apples I've ever heard. He stopped, digging. It's the truth. Of course it is, I said. That's how you lie. If you recall, I've seen you do it before. I started walking around the steel ranger as he continued to sit. You tell enough truth that any pony would buy your story. But here's where the saddle rubs. All your assessment had to have happened after you had situated yourself into our group. If anything, you just explained why you're still with us. I stopped in front of him and pointed. So, I ask again, why are you here? All right, Steelhoof snickered, standing up, repeating his words almost verbatim. Do you remember when you eavesdropped on my conversation with Calamity? The picture I painted of you and your friends? Again, I nodded. As what my elder believes you are. And my assignment is to assess the potential threat that you and the other residents of your stable you come from represent. No more secrets. That was my condition for not abandoning Steel Hooves. He responded by giving me the box of memory orbs as a token of submission. I had not expected that, but he insisted. After all, we both knew we really couldn't just take his word. I focused on one of them, showing him trust in return by allowing myself to become helpless at his company. The world melted away. I was wet. Rain was coming down the street, or in sheets from the blackness of the night sky. I was wearing a rain slicker, but the wind buffeted at that, pulling it away. Only the top of my mane was remotely dry under the hood. Lightning flashed, illuminating the Pegasus landing platform. Over two dozen floors above the building and the lights of the city below. I recognized the form of a giant scooter hovering over a well-lit building in the distance. This was Manhattan. Sure you want to be flying on a knot like this, Apple Snack, sir? A draperly dressed gray Pegasus buck asked as he shimmered himself in the harness of the sky chariot. It was a particularly beautiful chariot, adorned with a very familiar three-apple design. Very important business, I heard myself say in Apple Snack's voice. Has to be tonight. Well, that's what you're paying me for, right? Pegasus smiled. Although, it's likely to be a beastly ride. I'll survive. 
Adelsack said, as lightning flashed across the sky. The Pegasus gripped the harness strap in his teeth and pulled, drawing it tight. And how's Miss Applejack? I was really sorry to hear about her accident. The ponies who were supposed to be keeping those elevators in tip-top shape ought to be sent to jail. I felt my jaw tighten, but Applesnack kept his voice pleasantly even. Strapped in tight, wing right, I both felt and heard him ask. Don't want you slipping free in the rain now. Yeah, the Pegasus laughed. That would be one unpleasant fall. Applesack stepped into, the, stepped into the chariot, pressing as far forward as he could, as if afraid he might slip out the back at any moment that the Pegasus launched forward. The great Pegasus spread his wings, rain dripping off the feathers. Applesnack moved with alarming speed. I felt myself lurch forward, biting down, grasping the Pegasus's wings, winging my teeth. My host drew back, pulling, drawing the wing back over the metal front edge of the chariot as he raised up a hoof. Applesnack, whatcha? The Pegasus squeaked in surprise before I felt my hoof come down on that pulled wing with a bone-crunching blow. The Pegasus screamed. Spitting out the feathers of Wingrite, its now clipped wing, Steelhoofs growled, his voice low like thunder. Only three poonies know exactly when Applejack was going to be riding up that elevator. Ah! My wing! My wing! Wh what the hell? I checked your finances. Your account got a sudden influx of coins three weeks ago, and an even bigger one less than eight hours after Applejack's incident. I was staring into the widening eyes of the blubbering Pegasus. My voice was dangerously low. My heartbeat wasn't raised at all. Really, you should have choice something other than your own Philly's middle name as a password. I... I can explain, the Pegasus wailed, cradling his shattered wing. My sister died in the war. It was an inheritance. I don't think so. Applesnack turned and stepped down off the chariot. Then I felt as my host lifted his back hooves and planted them against the rear of the chariot. Slowly, he began to shove, pushing it across the rain-slicked rooftop as the hapless Pegasus went along with it. What? No! What are you doing? Don't! The Pegasus cried out, trying feebly to push back as he was shoved closer and closer to the edge. Please! I have a family! Stuhus grunted, stopping. Maybe you should have thought of them before you made your choice. He gave a final hard buck to the back end of the chariot, sending it toppling over the lip of the roof, Pegasus and all. I could hear the winged pony scream right up until the chariot bounced off the first outcropping on its way down to the streets below. I felt utterly stunned, numb, as my host's legs carried me toward the nearest door at a casual, splashing trot. I felt him rehearsing under his breath. There's been a terrible accident. No, I have no idea where he was flying in from. I could tell he was coming in too low, but I expected him to pull up just before hitting the building. It was horrible. I feel it was my fault. I shouldn't have asked Wingwright to fly in this weather. I should have known that the wind shear would be too much for him. The memory ended. I stared back at Steelhoofs in horror. He stared back calmly. No secrets. We are not primitive tribals, striking our hooves against stone, hoping to create fire. We are building a better tomorrow for our children, and our children's children. We built it through the sweat and blood we spill to restore the foundations of industry to our great nation. Because without industry, there is no progress. And we are not content to allow another 200 years to go by without pony kind reduced to scavengers. Red Eye's speech ended 
his voice replaced by what sounded like carnival music. Twilight was descending over Philadelphia when we crested a small hill and I could glean where we were heading. Nearly two-thirds of Philadelphia had been cut off, sealed up from the ruins beyond the great metal wall. The bulk of the industrial center, the amusement park, whose roller coaster towered in the fading light. The Philadelphia crater itself, all hid inside. Not only did towers just inside the wall harbor guard ponies, but griffins patrolled the skies around. The glaring deriggables above provided additional sniper's cover. The second position of the Steel Rangers was obvious. The largest and most defendable building still intact outside the wall. The massive, gear-shaped emblem on the front of the building proclaimed that it had been even better than the crumbling. Two-story letters that cut through it. The Steel Rangers had taken over the headquarters of Stable Tech and converted it into a citadel. Calamity flew casually past me to hover near steel hooves. So, you ain't a, an elder because you chose not to be? He asked curiously. Maybe we ain't so different after all. I felt ice water run down my spine. Steel hooves turned to Calamity, studying the rush colored Pegasus for a moment. No, you flew towards your responsibilities in defiance of your own kind, heedless and ignorant of the consequences. Clemity flapped backwards a bit, a frown forming on his face. Steelers continued. I ran away from my responsibilities, because I understood exactly what the consequences would be if I did not. I knew there were ponies who would follow my example, and I was not willing to risk a civil war amongst the Steel Rangers. Turning away from Calamity, Sihu said firmly, We are nothing alike. Footnote, level up. New perk, tough hide, level two. The brutal experiences of the Question Wasteland have hardened you. You gain plus three damage, or plus three to damage threshold for each level of this perk you take. 